My name is Alex Caserta, and I come from an Italian heritage where food is given a high priority. This show provides the inside stories of the individuals in the food production industry and how they are producing food using an artisanal approach and innovative techniques. The entrepreneurs of the food industry will provide insights into food production, nutritional value, and the farm-to-table movement. Charcuterie Artisans. Daniele and Criminelli Fine Meats produces prosciutto, charcuterie, soppressata, salami, and pancetta. Marco, where are we right now? Well, here we are, Alex, answering your question, how is prosciutto made? In this room, as you can see, we can see the prosciutto, the legs, the raw material coming in after our specifications are met. In this room, pretty much what happens, the meat relaxes, the meat equalize in temperature, and they're getting ready to receive the first step, which is the salting. Okay. That's the very first step, answering your question. Here is the room where we are. And how cold is it in here? This is probably minus two, above two degrees. Oh, all right, very cold. Very cold, so it's time yeah. to move to the next stage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Marco, uh, what room are we in now? So just to follow up, what we were talking in the other room, Alex, yep. where we receive the meat and we wait there to equalize the temperature and the meat to relax. After that stage, we bring them over here to this room, right? And in this room, we start working with the salt. You know, there are a couple of stages of salting in the prosciutto. So over here, where you can see, as the salt is penetrating, is withdrawing the water from the hands, right? And you can see how it's dripping and this is what you want to see in this stage, in this room. For every molecule of salt that you put in it, one molecule of water gets withdrawn. Comes out, okay. And that's how it, can, it starts the process of dry curing prosciutto. You can also see the, the, the change of color in the meat. Correct. And that's pretty much the effect of the salt in a raw piece of meat. I mean, you can do that at home in your own meat, and that's the, the way they start preserving. The changing of the color is the first step in start drying curing the meat. Uh, temperature probably between three and four degrees Celsius, and that's what's gonna happen to this hem. A lot of humidity as the salt travels through the core of the product. You can also see the uh, design that's being created where the uh, salt is, is penetrating. It's got almost like a little square design on the top. Right. That's what happens when we start absorbing the, 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 and it's applied only in the open face of the hems, you know, not on the, on the skin or in the back of it. And that's where it starts traveling through. And that's what the effect that you see through those kind of little squares, if you will. They're gonna sit there for a, a week to two weeks, depending on the stage, and then they're gonna be moved out for the next step. But here is the very first step. We use sea salt and pork. Those are the only two ingredients in prosciutto. Okay. So Alex, over here, as we follow the process and we were in the salting rooms where the hams are laying flat, after that stage, we bring them to a piece of equipment that we remove the salt, kind of wash the hams, yeah. and then they switch position. They're hanging upright. Hanging up. And that's where we bring them over here to a pre-resting room. Uh, they're gonna sit here for a, a couple months through the process at a low temperature. I mean, worth to mention that prosciutto, the difference is a product that starts at a low temperature and as it advances in the process, we're gonna be increasing the temperature. So if it ends up in a warmer place, if you will. That's what we do over here. They sit quietly and they move along with their dry curing process. Now, has this been salted once or twice? These camps are being salted twice. Okay. There's two salting steps on prosciutto. And after the second step of salting is where we clean, we wash, and then we hang them upright. 
Salting happens flat, what we saw before in the other rooms. Okay, and you say a couple of months in here, so the process of uh, drying out continues. Absolutely. And uh, the flavor change and the smell also uh, changes. Correct, as we go through the process, through the ro different rooms, you're gonna smell something different. Every stage, you're gonna have different sets of temperature in every single stage as well. So here is the very beginning, if you will, of the dry curing process. Okay. So Marco, we're in the uh, greasing room right now. Uh, the hams have been uh, washed and they come here and the temperature is much different in this room. It's much warmer, I noticed. Right. We're not freezing. Uh, and what does that temperature change due to the prosciutto? Well, in, in prosciutto, we start very cold, you know, and we move all our way up towards the end of the process with higher temperatures. In this room, the pro receives uh, a higher temperature and it's gonna be relaxing the meat and it's gonna get ready for the next stage which is the coating with fat pork, right? So we coat the pieces, the open face of the prosciutto and we do that because if we don't coat that open face, it's gonna kind of sear. And if it sears that, if it gets a crust built in, you're not gonna be able to continue to dry cure, meaning the water doesn't come out, it's blocked. By putting a, a special coat of pork fat, which is permeable, breathable, it continues the process of dry curing, right? And okay. you apply that only in the open face, you don't need to apply the entire piece, right? And that happens in this stage of the, the process. And you can see how the color it starts driving it towards a darker color from the previous rooms that we were. Yes. That's part of the normal process. That's what we can say is the moving process of prosciutto. That flavor, that color, that aroma, that texture that we're gonna see towards the end and then probably taste it at the end of the end. And over a period of time, that flavor actually enhances. Enhances, absolutely. And oh. the color as well and the texture as well. Marco, uh, we can see here where the grease has been applied to the uh, face of the ham. And um, you, you can certainly tell by the color. Now, how long will this stay on here? Well, this grease will uh, accompany the product all the way to the end of the process, Alex. Okay. So pretty much right before the deboning stage, uh, there is like a clean station in which when the, the, that coat of fat will be removed and the hem will be washed, and then prior to going to the deep boning room where they're gonna follow the, the next steps. But that coat will accompany the pro. That's what's gonna protect the prosciutto not to be over dry, and allow the dry curing process to continue for the next five, six, seven, eight months, whatever is needed. And it will be, uh, this coat will allow for the water to come out, to keep that process, for the color to get enhanced, the flavor, the velvet texture to be there. That's what's gonna be doing that. From now on, there is no more steps to add to this product. The hams, they will be hanging there for another five, six months, like I said. Okay, and so the, the color is constantly uh, moving, moving and changing. This takes quite a long period of time before you come to that finished product. Correct. It takes a number of steps. You go through temperature changes, you go through salting, you go through a covering uh, of, uh, of uh, a, coat. a coating. And this has been done for a number of years. Uh, yeah, abs actually, you know, the, the first time prosciutto, if I'm not mistaken, it, it goes back over a thousand years ago. Uh, and the very first one was a uh, uh, in the northern part of Italy, they used to preserve them with salt. Yes. You know, kind of stacking one on top of the other one, and the salt would preserve that. It was later that the Romans, 
the, they created, they invented the air curing process and which one they start hanging them. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's over a thousand years ago, there is truly evidence, you know, facts of in the trade, you know, in the commerce about prosciutto. So God knows how much before that evidence that is out there, prosciutto was made. is fascinating Alex I mean I get goosebumps just thinking about every time I say it or every time I hear from them this family uh, their the origins goes back to Croatia Croatia and they fled the Communist Party and literally literally they were running they start running away from their country and at a certain point they stopped running because they saw a soldier with an American flag as soon as she saw that American flag, she knew they were safe, if you will. Right? Yes. So little by little, they need to start a profession. They need to start working, you know. Uh, and what they did, they start working in the sausage business. Okay. They start so. working with some friends. They had, the founder of this company, Mr. Vlado Duksevich, right? Uh, he was a little kid back then. His father used to deliver the sausages that they used to make in the stores, right? And uh, in the, her, 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 his wife used to make the sausages and he used to deliver them and little by little, the business started growing. It grew, it grew and it got rich, it got bigger. And at a certain point, Mr. Duksevich Vlao decided to come to America and open this factory that you see here in Rhode Island. You know, it's close to a million square foot nowadays. Wow. And he truly, truly was the pioneer of prosciutto in the United States. And a charcuterie board is kind of, you can't get tired of it. Food is the magnet yes. for family and friends. You know, in Italy, the most important room in a house is the kitchen. That's where we all gather there, you know, to laugh, to cry, to enjoy. Yes. And nothing better than having some beautiful meats to go with that. A little wine. Absolutely, <laughs> all the time. We should go get for some of that now, actually. We should do that. <laughs> the Criminelli Company was founded in 2007 by Cristiano Criminelli, Chris Bowler, and Jared Lynch. The Criminelli family has been producing artisan meats and cheese for multiple generations. The family came from Biella, Italy, and Cristiano moved to Salt Lake City in 2006 to produce charcuterie because the dry climate in Utah is similar to Northern Italy. You came in all the way from Salt Lake City, Utah. What do you do in Utah uh, compared to uh, over here in Rhode Island? Uh, the process is, uh, is very, very similar. Okay. At the end, we do like Italian dry salami. And uh, what you can see here is exactly what we do in Utah. So let's say they're like two sister company, one working in Rhode Island and the other one in Utah. We have maybe a little bit of different recipe because uh, the Duce Beach family is a little bit more from northeast of Italy. My family is, act is actually more from northwest of Italy. So we do some different salami, some different recipe, but let's say the the way we do is almost the same. Okay, what are we standing in front of over here? Uh, this one is a, is a, a drying room, and uh, is the first step of uh, the salami after they are stuffed. They come inside the drying room and they ferment. So, a lot of people don't know salami is a fermented product. So there is bacteria, they work uh, inside with meat, with sugar, and with water to transfer basically the, the raw meat was salami. The, the sweet method, so the salami made in the Italian method, they never go more than 70, 72, 73 degrees. So it's actually not a cooked meat, it's just uh, fermented. Fermented, not cooked, okay. The, the fermentation itself actually makes the meat safe. Why? Because uh, there is a kind of bacteria inside, the same family of the lactobacillus bacteria, they react uh, with the water and they react with, uh, with sugar. This is why in some salami you see in the label sugar, but in the final product, sugar is zero. 
because sugar is basically the food we give to the bacteria. So the bacteria can start the fermentation. When they fermented the sugar, they produce lactic acid and they change the pH of the meat. Okay. Changing the pH of the meat, basic, of the meat basically is something like uh, changing all the environment. So the only bacteria able to survive in the new, very acid environment is the lactobacillus. If you have other bacteria, like bad bacteria, for example, I don't know, Salmonella, E. coli, yeah. Listeria, you know, this kind of guy, they're going to die because uh, the environment is not good for them. So fermenting the meat, basically you make the meat safe without cooking. And it's a very old method, because if you think the first time uh, the salami was fermented was during the Roman Empire, and was a mistake. So let's say something like jerky, to give you an idea, yeah. you know? But in this way, with a lot less water, they're able to preserve the meat for weeks. And believe me, at this time was something incredible. Think about the Roman Empire. They are warriors, they go all around to conquer new land. They need supply and they need uh, meat because mm. this guy, they need to fight. And have something actually you can preserve for some week was a, a life changing because they can actually be uh, more aggressive. They can yeah. conquer more area without stopping to- Take the food with them. Exactly. The things happen when they start not just to uh, cut some stripe, but also, let's say, to grind the meat and put and stuff inside the beef intestine. And usually they store salami close to the, 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 to the cheese. So they did what we call a cross-contamination yes. right now. You know, touching the cheese, transferring the bacteria on the salami. They really don't know what they do, but they understand flavor is a lot better. But the most important things, then the meat is not just some week of, uh, of shelf life, but become like three, four, five months. So it was, again, it was incredible. And, and it's a discovery, like they really don't know what happened, but they just know if we put salami close to the cheese, this is what happened. We they, can they, they didn't know what the science was. Exactly. All they knew is that, that it worked. Sure. Cured meat seems to be becoming more popular nowadays in this country. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's, and become really popular here now. I think, uh, you know, I find myself in U.S. and I think the U.S. right now is the place to be if you want to do food. I think yeah. it's the place with the rhinoceros of the food. Why? Because if you think just 10, 15 years ago, people watch food like more like gas for your body. You know, I need to eat because I need to do yes. something, you yes. know. Then little by little they start to understand it's not really correct. I want to enjoy and I want to know what I do. Yes. And I want to know what I eat. So now they pay a lot of more attention. This is why people like me, artisans like me, they find like a, the best place possible because yeah. they're ready. People here are ready to hear the story, buy this kind of food, understand why it's made in this way and, and understand all the little change between one flavor to the other one. People yeah. actually, they want good food and they want to understand what they eat yeah. and they want to understand the history yes. behind the product. Because, you know, here, if you see, it's just a, a salami, but all we talk about Roman Empire and everything is, is incredible. And also arriving to the, let's say, the time of today, uh, the different recipe, what they are made in this way. That he whole hands-on family recipe, uh, using local ingredients, Exactly, you yeah. touched exactly point. Yeah. Because local ingredients is everything. Why in Tuscany everything is made with fennel? Fennel. Because fennel is in everywhere. Yeah. It's the spice everybody uses and then in the spice everybody likes. So in Tuscany they do finocchiona with fennel inside because it's this way. It's, people like this flavor. If you, guy, if you go in the, in the south of Italy, it's more like spicy, more like chili, Cayenne, yeah, paprika. more towards Sicily, the more spicy, and because of because of the people, the Moors, and and the people that came to conquer the land, they brought their food with them. Exactly. They brought their history with them. Exactly. And as you move up to Italy, it's less of the um, the red sauce, more of the creamy sauce. Exactly. It all changes. It's, all, it's always an, an expression of the territory. Yes. Where you are. Then there is a lot of inventive because I tell you, you know, like basically you can use everything coming in your mind to do a salami. 
uh, and invented new stuff, but the, let's say the original recipe, the traditional recipe, they are made in this way just because uh, this is what they find in, in the area. And usually the name is not uh, a fantasy name. Or is the name of the town where it's made? Yes. Or is the name of the main uh, spice inside? Every mouthful yeah. should bring joy. Should bring joy, 100%. I'm with you. Yeah. In Italy, the charcuterie board is called antipasto. Yes. Means before dinner or before lunch. So it's something like, in the meantime, we wait the pasta boiling and become ready. We sit all around the table with a good glass of wine, a good piece of cheese, some salami, some bread, and we start to talk about the day. How was your day, you know? So it's bringing joy to the table, bringing like all the family around the table. So it's, it's, a, it's a very good occasion. Yeah. <laughs> good. <laughs> it's part of life. It's part of life. It's an important part of life. Yeah. You know, Italian is very, in Italy, it's very common you take the job of your father yes. and then you pass down the job to the son. So, uh, my family did this job for a lot of generations. I think the first record we have is around the 14th century, to wow. give an idea. So, we, we talk about a lot of time ago. But again, it's not really, it's normal. And uh, according to the family legend, because you know, like, uh, you, it's yeah. like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the, the first real record we have is, is about my grand grandfather because our family was like a nomad family you know in the past there is no refrigeration nothing so the only right. only way to do salami was basically move from one city to the other process the, the pig and then go to the next city then i think was uh, 1907 if i recall well we stopped in biella the town where i where my family live right now just because they have the invention of the refrigeration. So we understand <laughs> if we put like a piece of rice inside a box, we can refrigerate right. meat, you know. Yeah. So was, everything was simple. And, uh, you know, all my family in the same job, my grandfather, my father, and, and, my, and then me. I started the first time in, uh, to be inside the, uh, the factory when I was four years old. I recall really well because they gave me like the worst uh, job possible. <laughs> Cleaning, casing, cleaning, yeah. yeah, cleaning, casing. Yeah. You know, because you need to start from the bottom to understand. Well, yes. And then uh, I was a little bit the black sheep of my family, and you know why? Because in Italy, if you move from one village to the other one, people watch you like, why? why? You don't like us? Why you move? You know, <laughs> I move in the other side of the world. I come here in the yeah. US, so they were like, yeah, no, you're totally out. You're, oh, everything yeah. is wrong. But you know. I was lucky enough to have everything ready. I have a company in Italy, my father, my grandfather started the company, everything was working well, but I was feeling like, you know, I want to start from zero. I want to see if I'm able to do something for zero. So I tell to my father, hey, can, can I go away for a year and see if I'm able to do what I have in my mind? If I saw it's not going to work, I come back. And, I moved to Salt Lake, you know, I have the, the opportunity to meet two really good friends, they become my two business partner, and we start from there, from a basement of a friend, and then from there, little by little, we change, I think, seven different factors in five years, wow. because, you know, uh, you know the business, you saw before, like, you need space for aging. You don't need really a lot of space for producing, but you need a ton of space for aging. So I recall the last factory before the one we have right now was 6,000 square feet. We have salami in the office and gap in the office because <laughs> we need to find a place to put the salami. And now we, then we move in Salt Lake, we find this amazing factory. And now I'm, I'm, I'm a US citizen. So, you know, this, to, to be brief, like this is what happened, like from Biella, Italy to Salt Lake City, Utah. And what you're trying to do here, uh, Marco, with the um Daniele uh, prosciutto uh, <coughs> and the way you age it and the way you control the temperature and, and the way you know uh, that uh, this ham is spending the needed time at each temperature in order to come out with a beautiful final product. When you look at just the color mm -hmm. of this meat here and you look at the color of the fat, you know how it's going to taste. It's going right. to be out of this world. You can tell from looking. The product itself is telling you when it's ready. Yes. 
<clears throat> especially with prod that have this craft, this this type of a dry current process. You know, it's not like a, you put into a clock in a program in which one, yes, I'm gonna be there for 10 months or 12 yeah. months, have this temperature, this cell, and then you're out. You know, every piece is different. Here at Daniele, we select every single piece, gets touched and make sure it's ready. If not, it goes back and finishes. So it's not like a full lot of a pro that is ready to be packed and shipped. You know, so basically the pro tells you when it's ready to be packed, when it's ready to be trimmed, when it's ready to be deboned. And then we slice and put in beautiful packages that, you know, the final consumer can enjoy, right? Since the pro is telling you when it's ready, you know, it always starts with the raw material. I mean, what are these hogs, these pigs eating? What are they fed with? And that's how, that's how it's driven. Then you, you, you're learning more about the process. They have a different flavor. They have a different breed that we can see growing more and more in the United States mm -hmm. nowadays. And you end up with having a perfect piece of prosciutto that is dry cured accordingly to the specs that itself is telling you to when it's ready. When you think about this, I don't know how many types of food you can make a list of in which one that has only one ingredient. Yeah. Salt. Salt. Here's a and very time. simple problem. Salt. Yeah. And time. This is the closest I've been to a prosciutto with a knife. And uh, it's very inviting. <laughs> 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 but literally, that, that's where it is. Salt and time. Yes. Very simple. Yes. Yeah. Simple. But, but you know, if you don't have yours born, we can always taste the product. <laughs> <laughs> Not so bad, huh? honestly. <laughs> <Yeah. So. laughs> You're a pro. Dieci mesi. Ten months. Mm. Wow, it's really sweet. Very good. Here, Alex, have another piece. Cristiano, mm. altro pezzo, una fetta. Always. I'm always ready. You to can't say another. no to prosciutto. Never. Oh, you look. You're a pro. No. Oh, yeah. I'm hungry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Alex. <laughs> Un'altra fetta, Cristiano. Yeah, this one on the top. Look. You guys want to try? Yeah, of course. Sure. All right, we can cut. In Italy, we tell one prosciutto a day, take the doctor away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way. I love that. <laughs>